Thank you. Now we're going to be starting in uh, Genesis 37 tonight. Um, obviously, when you start in Genesis 37, there was indeed a Genesis 1 through 36. <laughs> and there was all sorts of events uh, going on in, in Genesis 1 through 36 with, uh, with varying degrees of, um, of our knowledge and understanding. Um, I want you to, um, to consider the names that, that are appearing on your screen right now. Um, Abraham, Jacob, Sarah, Rachel, Isaac, Reuben, Rebecca, Simeon, and Levi. And, and think about their lives and, and consider their character. Abraham lied about his wife two different times. Sarah tried to force God's will by having her maid sleep with Abraham. Isaac also lied about his wife and showed preference for one son over another. Rebecca also showed preference for one son over another, also deceived her own husband. Jacob's, whose very name is, 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 is attached to trickery and deception uh, throughout his lifetime. Uh, Rachel, who stole her father's gods, which is a totally messed up sentence from start to end. <laughs> uh, Reuben slept with his father's concubine. Simeon Levi murdered an entire male population of a village and then plundered the rest of the village. These are God's chosen people. Whoa. <laughs> and, and these are the ones through whom God brings the... Uh, eventually, God is going to bring Jesus uh, into the world. These are his chosen folks. What, what gets to be interesting, though, is when we come to Genesis 37, there is someone new who rises to center stage. And he's probably, at least um, in my opinion, he's probably the only person in the patriarch um, message of Genesis 12 through 50, the only one who isn't presented to us with significant baggage. And his name, of course, is Joseph. Uh, Joseph's life covers, uh, in the Bible, covers 14 chapters. That is more uh, material than Adam, more than Noah, more than Abraham. Uh, we, we talk more about Abraham, but there's actually more than Joseph. Um, more than there is about Isaac, more than there is about Jacob. But I want to ask you, as based on what you already know about Joseph, why do you think it is that uh, God, through his spirit, would devote so much attention to Joseph? Why was it so important for that to be preserved for us thousands of years later? What do you think? Uh, David. David. Uh, well, Joseph was persecuted in, in, a, in a sense, but Joseph did it right. I think more than anything, Joseph did it right. And, and we're going to see that time after time after time. Great point, David. Uh, um, I, I think um, he's very important to me because his sufferings were long and, and lengthy. And yet he persevered in his faithfulness um, and his belief that God would take care of him. I appreciate you sharing that, uh, Jeannie. And something I hadn't thought about, honestly, was the um, in, in these different stages, the, the, these are significant years. And, and it was indeed, uh, th this wasn't a, a quick thing for him by any stretch of the imagination. Thank you. I think Joseph went through a lot of ups and downs in his life. Um, it's amazing that he went through what he went through and uh, still persevered and yet ended up becoming a ruler after it was all said and done. I just I think it's an amazing life that he lived. Absolutely amazing life. Um, and not only a ruler, but a ruler in <clears throat> Egypt of all places. Right. Exactly. Absolutely remarkable, Jack. Uh, Tom Green. Well, 
others have said it, but you know, we, we learn uh, how suffering, no matter how unfair, um, it, it developed a very strong character in Joseph, um, but more importantly, a great wisdom. I think so too. Uh, Mary. One of the things that one of the things I love in Joseph's story was, you know, how he maintained that integrity, especially when he fled um, uh, part of his wife. But um, the more importantly, what he's taught me is um, everything that his brothers had done to him and what he had to go through as a result of their mistreatment. He still uh, had, you know, taught us how to forgive. He said, "With God was preparing him for such a time, is that." you know, later on when there was a famine in the land. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So um, uh, our plan over the next several weeks uh, for May and <laughs> at least mid-June is going to be to look at uh, Joseph's life up close. And I'm calling this series Character Development uh, with a, a couple of nuances to that. Um, any movie you watch, you see how, if it's an effective movie, you see how a character develops from the beginning to the end. And you see how someone has uh, changed, matured, grown because of what he or she has endured. And we're going to see how some different things uh, grow Joseph's character. And for the lack of, of some kind of fancy word, we're just going to call them tests. Um, the several tests he's going to go through in his life, good and bad, to perhaps discover uh, some things that perhaps can help us as, as we continue to try to grow to be more like Jesus every day. Ultimately, uh, part of my goal in this is that we will be able to, uh, when we're done, that we will be able to discover why um, out of all the people to say these words, um, it was Pharaoh who said this in Genesis chapter 41, verse 38. He said, can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the spirit of God? And we'll talk about what Pharaoh might have meant a good bit more when we actually get to that passage. But um, for Joseph to have that significant of an impact on an Egyptian ruler, just thinking through the, the, the chances of that happening, um, uh, just on so many levels. Now, what we're not going to see in Genesis 37 through 50 is any specific miracle of God. And, and what I mean by the word miracle is we're not going to see a, a direct intervention that comes in and, and, and alters nature in some way. Uh, we're not going to, we're not going to see that. Uh, what we are going to see is God's providential hand ruling and ordering events, uh, one after another after uh, another. Um, let's uh, take a quick look before Genesis 37 at the, uh, the first words we read about Joseph, his birth, Genesis chapter 30, verses 22 through 24. And um, I'm going to have somebody else read Genesis 37 later, but I'll take this passage in Genesis 30. Um, verse 22 says, God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and opened her womb. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And, and she said this, God has taken away my disgrace. It's an interesting thing to say. She named him Joseph. And then she said, may the Lord add to me another son. Um, interesting on a lot of levels. Been waiting for a son my whole life. Here he comes. Give me another one, God. Uh, give me another one. Um, it, it, it's remarkable uh, on, on a lot of levels. We get an immediate idea, though, before we even get into chapter 37. We get an idea off the bat that, that Joseph has a, is a little different than, at least in the eyes uh, of Jacob and Rachel. Um, there's something different here in the birth of Joseph. Uh, in comparison to the others. Um, remember, before we go back to chapter 37, that Joseph is, or rather Joseph's father, Jacob, is a polygamist. 
he has 13 different children with four different wives and they're all living in the same house. Isn't that exciting? Mm. Um, Joseph's father and his maternal grandfather parted ways after years of one trying to one-up each other, trying to cheat each other, uh, remembering the story of Jacob and Laban uh, going back and forth and back and forth. Now, Jacob's mother, on the other hand, she sneaked the family idols out of her father's house, and when it looked like she'd be caught, she got away with it by blaming her inability to move on her period. Joseph's stepsister is raped. His stepbrother Simeon and Levi avenged the act by murdering every man in Shechem, looting the city and taking the women and children as plunder. Uh, Reuben, we mentioned at the beginning of the class tonight with uh, his relationship with his father's concubine. Um, so that's when we were talking about rating this class, kind of joking before we actually started tonight. Um, <laughs> there are some things in Genesis that are for mature audiences only. Uh, there there is a um this but the reason i brought this up is not not to be sensual and sensational i brought it up for just to just to get the fullness of the context of joseph's environment because this is the environment in which this this young man is being raised and this is the environment that joseph in a lot of ways is going to have to overcome uh, to display some of the character that he uh, possesses. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, I think I just want to do one through uh, 14 uh, tonight. Um, it, this is going to look a little unusual in your Bibles because in your Bibles, you've probably got a break either after verse 10 or verse 11. Um, I want to take us into the first half of 14 tonight and hopefully it'll make since why by the time we get to the the end uh could I have somebody read for us genesis 37 and just read for us 1 through 14 i'll do it jack thank you sir jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed the land of canaan this is the account of jacob's family line Joseph, a, long ma a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved jo Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he, had, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And when he told his father as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now his brothers had gone to graze the father's flocks near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, as you know, your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I'm going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Then he sent him off in, from the valley of Hebron. All right. That'll be our cliffhanger for now. <laughs> um, 
right off the bat, uh, just to point out something that that's uh, that I at least I find uh, interesting. Um, your text uh, might say this is the account of Jacob. Um, as uh, Jack just read, some of your Bibles say this is the account of uh, Jacob's family line. Um, there is a Hebrew word called toledot. And a Toledot is a, a very common literary form uh, used throughout uh, Genesis. Well, it's used three times in Genesis. Uh, in Genesis uh, chapter 11, um, it's used by this. This is um, the story of Abraham's father. And then you start reading about Abraham. And then in Genesis 25, um, the text says, here's basically the, the story of Isaac. And from that point forward, you're reading about Jacob. Um, so uh, basically what's happening here is in a very real sense, Jacob's life is being told through his succeeding generations. Uh, which is a, a significant Hebrew concept that that my life is being lived and my and my story is being told in, in a very real sense by the way that those who come after me uh, live and by the way that they uh, conduct themselves. So um, there's some significance in that before we go in, before we even read anything. Uh, that that's a message there uh, for us. Now you'll see where Joseph starts. He's starting off at the bottom rung. He's with the uh, sons of Bilhah, uh, Dan and Naphtali, and the sons of Zilpah, Gad and Asher. So he's working with the lowest order sons, uh, learning how to care for the sheep, uh, which makes what we'll read about the robe here in just a moment all the more interesting. Um, now, the text says in the end of verse 2, his father, um, he was out there with, it, with the flocks, and he brought their father a bad report. Um, what kind of bad report can you imagine Jacob could bring about his brothers based on what we know so far? They're part of it. All right, Dan, it broke up just a little bit. Say it again. I said they're out there partying, not paying attention to their flock. They very easily could be um, not paying a bit of attention to their job and, and, and living a party life for sure, okay? That sounds like something the youngest brother would tell on the oldest, doesn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. We already know uh, what these brothers are capable of. Um, so it could have indeed, they're, they're not paying attention uh, to their job. Uh, they could have been working on something to uh, get an upper hand on their dad. Um, they could have been getting a little too involved in what was going on around them. But, but the, 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 uh, the scene is already set a little bit when we read that Joseph, I'm sorry, that Joseph already once before has uh, given a bad report uh, about his brothers. So, so that's kind of our, our, one of our scene setters before we add the next layer, which is that Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. That never causes a problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you love, you, and, and it's that overt uh, that you have more love for one uh, than you have uh, for the others. Um, and, you know, it's perhaps that Jacob really did think of Joseph as his oldest son. If he thought of, of Rachel as his legitimate first wife, because this was the one he had worked for and wanted all of his life, and, and Joseph being the firstborn of Rachel, so it seems like in a lot of ways, Jacob really did think of Joseph as uh, his firstborn uh, in a very real sense, so much so that he does this robe. So um, tell me what, uh, go ahead, David. And then uh, after David, I want, want to hear from you about the robe. Go ahead, David. Well, actually, it is about the robe. Um, in the literal, and I'm sorry, I didn't do this in advance, but I don't think 
that the actual ancient Hebrew says anything about it being ornate. It's just, it says long coat. Um, it, it does. And the, the thing about the long though, is it distinguishes it from what a shepherd should have been wearing. Oh no, I, I get that. I get that. Uh, but most translations, and you know, we have the whole technical, you know, yeah. you know yeah, technical thing that came, that, that's yeah. Hollywood and all that, but, but yeah. I, I think we need to be careful about what it really says there. Yeah. But it does differentiate. You're right. I mean, you don't go out and tend sheep with you know a coat down to your ankles. <laughs> yeah, and, and that and that was and I'm glad you said that because that's more of the differentiation um, between the um, another thing that's showing uh, Joseph as a having a favored uh, status because everybody's got a robe. Um, this this is from Wearsby, by the way. A typical robe was used for warmth to bundle up belongings, wrap babies. Most robes were knee-length, knee short-sleeved, and plain. Joseph's robe was probably the kind worn by royalty because it was long-sleeved, ankle-length. Um, wearing this robe would have, under normal circumstances, would have excused uh, Joseph from manual labor, which is a whole other story. If Joseph's 17 years old, he's perfectly well, strong young teenager, probably perfectly well capable of being it with his brothers if Jacob had so chosen. Uh, for him to be out there tending the sheep with him and, and go ahead david yeah another thing i want to point out is okay 17 or whatever he was he was well past the age of manhood in the culture at the time right we might have considered him well maybe you're ready to go out in the real world but probably not in that world he was an adult he might have been living under his father's roof but he was an adult and he and and for that reason it makes it's all the more curious that joseph's still where he is Absolutely. If you're Joseph and you have this crazy dream <laughs> and you've got some idea of what it might be saying and there's one of you and there's 10 of them because we're not counting Benjamin, obviously. Um, do you keep your mouth shut or do, or do you do you talk about it? I think I I would be tempted to be very quiet, yeah. uh, personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Joseph is more than willing uh, to to share it. Um, it makes you wonder in this is this in this one case is he a pest or a prophet? Um, but he was also willing to be a tattletale too. That's very true, Jeannie. Uh, <clears throat> And he's proven that more than more than willing to. Um, so God take, yeah, go ahead, David. Well, yeah, and I think there's, in all of this, there's some ambiguity, right? Because to Jeannie's point, okay, is he a tattletale or is it true evil? Okay, again, the literal says evil, right? Um, if, if these people, if his brothers are out there basically doing highway robbery on people passing through the land, well, yeah, I'd tell my father too, right? If they were, you know, slapping each other upside the head and telling dirty jokes, no, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. That's a very good point, David. And we know from their history that they are capable of both. Well, yes, since they almost tried to kill Joseph, right? Yeah, I mean... their, their pre <laughs> in their previous life experience, they've um, already done some things. Uh, Tom, go ahead. Well, we know that <clears throat> Joseph was, was pretty confident and uh, he had a, a very high self-assurance. Um, but in, in the context that we're studying and going out there and telling your brothers, and I agree with David, you know, at 17 at, at that time, he was a grown man. It showed a lot of immaturity, in my opinion. And, and you, you do have to wonder, was he naive and unaware, or was he taking delight in what he had to say? That's, you know, we don't know. Um, Richard, were you going to say something? Uh, I, I think I'll come back to David. I, I, Tom said exactly what I was going to say. Okay. Yeah, I think to his brothers, uh, he has a cockiness that borders on immaturity, and it probably was a little of both. Okay. All right. Which is not unusual for 17. Uh, David. And I don't disagree with that, but on the other hand, he's just had a dream that is probably from God, right? So how much of this is the spirit 
And how much of this is his ego? All right, I don't know. And that that is part of I think David that's part of the the mystery of this whole thing because because we don't know um, to what extent it was God's will for Joseph to share this dream uh, with his uh, brothers. Uh, now, why? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tom uh, McKay. Yeah, I, I think also uh, speaking from from a, a youngest brother, I have two older brothers, and uh, I would have thought many times not to talk about my brothers to my dad because I would have got beat up. And um, I learned that early. But uh, I think, you know, obviously he was doing what his father asked him to do it is one sense of this world. Obviously he was immature. I mean, at 17, even though he was, he was a full man at that time, um, he was still 17. And there was still a lot of life uh, let to be, you know, be lived by him. But one thing about the, the cut that I'd like to bring forward also is something else that would rub on these brothers is that I'm sure with such a large family and so many um, sons in that family, his brothers were probably used to envy down. And they were probably used to, you know, not having something new much less thing as as you know beautiful and and impressive as this long coat so that would obviously add to their fire and it was obvious to them that their their brother put above them in the first place and for him to go ahead and mention this dream i mean it's just inciting them in their anger but you can't blame joseph um as much for their anger as you can blame the brothers because it's up to them to hold their anger not just true true so why would the i think you already know this but um from a human point of view these dreams make no sense whatsoever why is that uh david because they're not human thoughts, they're, they're from God. Well, certainly that, certainly that. And, and, and he's, then, go ahead, Jesus. He's, he's the younger, younger, one of the youngest. So and he the, had, you know, a position of authority within the family. Yeah, and for that reason, um, in, the, in what they perceived as the real world, uh, none of them would have ever been bowing down to Joseph and the father would have never, ever, ever, ever uh, been bowing down uh, to a son. So, um, but he from, does. From an earthly point of view, it's like, what in the world is going on here? We, what, we, um, Mike, what, what <laughs> the age of majority? Is it 12? When we believe it was 12. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even in modern day Judaism, boys are, are uh, uh, yeah. bar mitzvah somewhere between 12 and 13 birthday. Yeah. Which, which makes this um, all the more interesting that for Joseph, I mean, Jacob rather. Uh, look at verse 10. Uh, when he told his father, as well as his brother, so he told his dad too, um, is bold enough to tell your brothers one day you're going to bow down to me. It tells his dad one day you're going to bow down to me too, dad. I didn't say it that way. Just, just told him the dream. Note, notice uh, Jacob's reaction. What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to you and ground before you? Sounds like a little bit of a rebuke. It is a rebuke. But now I want you to notice verse 11. His brothers were jealous. However, his father kept this all in mind. So why does why do we have that phrase at the end of verse eleven? Jacob's just going to kind of file this one away in the back of his memory bank and hold on to it. Why is that so? It reminds me of um, the the verse about Mary um, doing the same in response to Jesus's actions as a child, taking something and pondering it in her heart, treasuring it in her heart. That's a good point, Jeannie. Very good point. Uh, go ahead, David. 
Uh, he may have sensed the hand of God himself. I wonder. I really do wonder. And, and part of the reason I, I wonder is because you remember Jacob had a pretty wild dream himself. The <laughs> uh, you know, whole ladder deal in Genesis 28 uh, was was a pretty wild night for, for Jacob. So he knows what it's like to have an unusual dream. Uh, so it's very interesting that it says Jacob is just going to hold on to this and kind of kind of keep it uh, in mind. Um, anything else sticks out in your mind in uh, verses 1 through 11? All right, so Joseph and his brothers are gone, verse 12, to graze their father's flocks near Shechem. Um, very interesting that they are 50 miles from home when there's probably better grassland available closer to Hebron uh, than in Shechem. Um, the boys seem to be very happy to be 50 miles away from home uh, for, for whatever reason. Um, makes you wonder why they're trying, why they are indeed uh, so far away. Um, so we, we see that they're that far away and Israel says, as you know, your brothers are grazing uh, the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. I want you to think about how much Jacob loves Joseph. Um, that we know not only from Genesis chapters 25 through 37, but we know as we read the rest of the story, uh, Jacob's intense love for Joseph. Because he loves his son so much, how wise is it to send his son to go check on his brothers, giving the circumstances at home? Since his brother hated him, I would say it was not all that wise. From from hindsight, we've got an obvious. What were you thinking? Um, but but we also know we also know that um, the brothers have have a history uh, of crazy behavior. We know that Joseph is has no problem ratting his brothers out. Um, the reason I bring this up is, is, is there are a lot of possibilities here and I'm not really seeing a good one unless he goes to Shechem and the boys are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is probably unlikely, quite honestly. Uh, David. Yeah, it could also be, um, and you know, we see this one event, but this could be part of a pattern or whatever of getting Joseph out there into the world you know, getting him some experience, getting him, okay. you know, away from the nest and, hey, 17 years old, you know, it's, it's get away from the apron strings. <clears throat> Maybe. I, Maybe. I think it's just, I think it's reflective of um, Jacob's uh, repeated bad judgment uh, <laughs> in life. I mean, there's multiple instances of that. And, you know his deceit and then his now showing favoritism i mean yeah I and pretty much when all when bad things start happening jacob is is always going to default to why is this happening to me and there's yeah. usually and there's usually a reason it's happening to him <laughs> uh let me go uh jack and then tom mctye well just in short i think there's a good possibility that god's involved in this Oh, <laughs> pretty much. So things are happening that might not, that maybe shouldn't happen, but they're happening according to his will, I think. You know, okay. I just think that's, it's, it's a flow that God has, I think as things happen, God's saying, whoops, I need, I need for that to happen. And so he just sort of turns the head and goes some other place with it, you know, but I believe he's playing a pretty important part in the flow of this story. His hands are all over all it. All over it. All yes, over it, Jack. They are. Uh, Tom McTy. I think it's also very possible that Jacob does not trust his brothers. Uh, he doesn't 
feel like he can trust him to be out there. He's already had one bad report from Joseph. And if Joseph is the only one that he can get a true and honest report from, maybe his concern about the flocks and his wealth overpowers his concern about something happening to Joseph. Maybe he doesn't think in his mind that his other sons would do anything to Joseph. And, you know, once again, he's concerned uh, that he needs to get an honest and true report from someone. Okay. All right. That's a good thought, Tom. Uh, Tom Green. Well, we have to keep in mind from Hebron to uh, Shechem, uh, like you said, is about a 50 mile distance. And to cover 50 miles in those days would take about four days. So they didn't have cell phones. They didn't have smoke signals. So it took him four days to get there and four days to get back. And then four days, you know, so this, this didn't happen overnight. No. So when, when he went there, saw what happened, went back to report to his father, the brothers could, they more than likely started their conniving. Mm -hmm. <gasps> Certainly possible. Certainly possible. Now, now here's my last question for you tonight. And, and to, you, you're seeing this from two or three different sides. If you're Joseph and you're 17 years old, and you have experienced what you've experienced at home. Um, and your father says, I want you to go to Shechem and check on these boys. Are you going to say, uh, yes, sir? Are you going to say, excuse me, sir, can we Dearly beloved father, can we please talk about this? Um, I'm just curious, what, what would you have done? Well, I would have said, why are you sending me four days to check on a bunch of guys that don't like me to begin with? <laughs> That's just blunt honest, Tom. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hmm. And... Um, I think, I mean, Joseph, it was naive because he shared the dream, you know, uh, like he did. So I don't know that he was fully aware of implications. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm kind of, uh, no, go ahead, Charlotte, I'm sorry. Um, he might have been naive, but looking at his past relationship with his brothers, they didn't like him, but they'd never heard him before. So he probably had a false sense of safety that he could go out there, do what he'd done before, and with no other results that they, you know, wouldn't hurt him. Yeah. Uh, Dan. I think Joseph actually believed that he would rule over his brothers in time. Mm -hmm. I think that too. He believed the dream. Yep. And if if and if you have if you believe that dream, there's going to be an you're going to have this aura of invincibility about you. Mm -hmm. uh, you've already got an aura of invincibility when you're 17 because you that's, that's the time of life when you think nothing can ever happen to you. Right. Uh, so you've been emboldened by, that's a very good thought, Dan. You've been emboldened by the stream uh, that you've had. Uh, David. Yeah, and in addition to that, at least in the literal, all, all it's, Joseph's reply is, here am I. Sound like some other people you've heard actually later in the Bible, yeah. but um, it's basically you know there there's not there's no hesitation there at all in, in what is presented at least in the Bible. And, so whether it's loyalty, stupidity, or what I don't know, but but there's no hesitation at all. And, and that's the um, and that's kind of where I wanted us to kind of land tonight is that. When, when Joseph is um, given instruction from his father, um, he, he just, here I am, and here I go. And that's one of the first tests in his life 
is, is when his father has called on called him to a task it's just here i am and here i go and, and i think there there's something whatever the motive um i think that's something for us to take uh to heart now of course uh next week we'll pick up on the second half of verse 14 and we'll see we'll see what we already know it did that did not end well uh, <laughs> But um, short run. But you know, um, as, as David just said, in the short run. But and sometimes when when we when our father calls us, and we say, "Here I am, here we go." Sometimes and the short term is not pretty. Uh, but we trust God's providential hand and what He's doing and what He's working and how He's working. Um, <coughs> a lot of times we don't understand. But, but we still trust in those moments. All right. Any final thoughts on what we've covered tonight? Um, I think that's just me. Uh, Jim Kaufman. Yeah, let's let's not lose sight of the fact that during that age, if you disobeyed your father, that was grounds for death. That's very true. Very true. Yeah. Yep. yep. Good point. They bring you up before the city, uh, before the, um, well, more in mosaic days, they bring you before the whole city gate at the elders, but, but it was a, it was a death penalty type of fence. Yeah, I think in the shepherd days, it was right here, right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 I might have negotiated before I obeyed if it was me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but uh, I appreciate you bringing that that up Jim because it is part of this uh, to keep in mind we're going to finish chapter 37 next week and uh, we'll see uh, the first time Joseph has to deal with some um, envy and mistreatment and, and <laughs> see some specific things that he dealt with there uh, thanks for thanks everybody for chiming in tonight appreciate what all of you had to say and what all of you brought to the table uh, Richard would you uh, lead us in a final prayer please sir Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this study in the middle of the week. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, gather as your believers and get in your word. We're so uh, thankful for Mike's ability to lead these lessons and for uh, everyone to uh, share in their individual knowledge and for all of us to glean from the wisdom of your word. Father, there's so many things we don't understand, but one thing we do truly understand is that you are in control. You are our lifeline, and it's through your son uh, that we will reach eternity. We just thank you for him. We thank you for the blessings of this life. Ask that you forgive us of our sins as we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Amen.